Hey there, everyone. Uh, so welcome back. Uh, last time uh, we finished up chapter 10 and specifically towards the end of that lecture, we talked about cardiac and smooth muscle. And those two types of muscle, particularly cardiac muscle, are going to be extremely important as we venture into the next few chapters, especially since we're really starting to talk about the cardiovascular system. So the heart, which you understand, of course, is made up of cardiac muscle. Its major function is to produce forceful contractions to push or pump blood out into the circulation, all for the purpose of delivering things like oxygen, nutrients, getting waste taken away from tissues, etc. So before we really get there, we want to spend in this chapter just a little bit of time talking about the blood itself with the understanding that the whole purpose of the heart is to pump this blood. So let's learn a little bit more about what the blood actually is, some properties it has before we really start talking about uh, the function of the heart and of the blood vessels that carry the blood. So. What is blood good for? You probably already have some pretty good ideas based on some things that we've talked about before, but first let's look at this through the lens of what does every cell in your body need? So this is something that of course we talked about in chapter one back in the beginning of the semester. Every cell in your body needs things like nutrients, energy substrates like carbohydrates, proteins and amino acids, fatty acids, etc. Every cell needs oxygen, coenzymes, cofactors, vitamins, the list goes on and on. We just kind of throw all those together in this one category that we'll just call nutrients. Every cell that goes through its metabolic processes is going to produce waste products like carbon dioxide and urea that need to be removed in a timely fashion. And then, of course, in chapter 17, when we talked about the endocrine system, every cell in the body is going to need to, in some way, be regulated by a variety of different hormones. So here is the issue, though. For every cell in your body, pretty much every one of them, they are not going to be able to just get up and walk out and go get what they need. They're not like us. They can't go to the grocery store to go get what they need, right? So. Almost every cell in your body, with some exceptions, is going to be basically fixed in place. It's kind of anchored down as part of a tissue or organ with really no means of, like I said, going up and getting what they need on their own. So that is where the blood comes in. The blood, since we understand, circulates throughout the body, delivers these nutrients that we talked about to cells, takes their waste away, and then also provides a vehicle through which we can regulate these cells through hormones, which of course we understand what makes a hormone is that it's a chemical signaling molecule, a regulator that is carried through the blood. And then some other uh, less obvious functions of the blood, uh, blood can be shunted from tissue to tissue, so we've talked about that before with the autonomic nervous system and vasoconstriction and vasodilation uh, for several purposes, including regulating the temperature of discrete locations within the body. Uh, the blood can also protect against foreign pathogens via the immune system, uh, and then also guard against blood loss due to injury through the process of blood clotting. So let's talk a little bit about the composition of blood. So what sorts of things do we expect to find in any given volume of blood? So you will recall all the way back to chapter four, which was a long time ago, uh, that blood is a type of connective tissue. Specifically, it is a fluid connective tissue. And it is going to consist of two major components. Uh, number one, which are called formed elements. So these are all of the different types of cells that you are going to find suspended within the blood. This is going to include things like red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, which we will expand upon a little bit more later. And then you have a blood plasma. So this is the actual fluid portion of the blood. So it is basically both the extracellular fluid and the extracellular matrix for those formed element cells that you find within the blood. So the plasma, we don't want to forget this based on discussions that we had way back when on uh, osmosis. We do not want to forget that the plasma is a solution, a solution being a solvent. In this case, of course, water. Water is always your solvent in biological systems. 
and then your solutes, which includes all the different chemical molecules and things that you find dissolved within that water. So salts, proteins, etc. All of those are going to impact the osmolarity of blood. And hopefully you recall that the osmolarity of blood is about 300 milliosmolar. So one way that we can actually both learn something clinically relevant and also get a better understanding for the composition of blood is by looking at a somewhat commonly performed technique called the hematocrit test. Basically what this involves is taking a very small volume of blood in a very narrow and uh, kind of thin test tube like what you see here and then because the formed elements being the cells are much, much, much more dense than anything else that you find in the blood, if you just leave that test tube suspended uh, vertically as you would in, say, a test tube rack, those cells are just going to kind of naturally over time sink to the bottom of the test tube. So you can do this either by waiting for that to happen or if you're in a hurry, you can do this by very light centrifugation to spin those cells down to the bottom. What the actual hematocrit refers to is what percentage of the entire volume of blood is made up of red blood cells, keeping in mind red blood cells carry oxygen throughout the body. So like I said, by centrifuging the blood, or if you're not uh, so, uh, if you have a lot of patients, you can just wait for it to happen naturally over time. The most dense elements, meaning the cells, will pack at the bottom and leave kind of a yellowish blood plasma at the top. So the blood plasma is not red. We understand that red color comes from the red blood cells, which of course contain the hemoglobin, in the same way that myoglobin in slow twitch muscle fibers produces a red color. Uh, and then it's kind of hard to see here, but right in between the plasma, which is yellow, and the uh, hematocrit, the red blood cells, which is red, is kind of a white buffy coat, which consists of all of the white blood cells and platelets. You can see that buffy coat is actually quite thin, indicating that white blood cells and platelets are really, relatively speaking, kind of a minor component of the whole blood. They actually make up less than 1% of total blood. Uh, so a normal hematocrit for, excuse me, a normal hematocrit for the general person is usually going to fall somewhere between, oh, 40 to 50 percent. It varies a little bit by gender, but you can actually see here uh, next to that normal one, uh, two different examples in which someone is either experiencing anemia, uh, which is a low red blood cell count that, of course, produces a decreased capacity for carrying oxygen throughout the body, or on the opposite case, you have polycythemia, in which case you have an elevated hematocrit and way too much of your blood volume is made up of red blood cells, which of course can be a problem too. Okay, so a number of different characteristics of the blood. Some, uh, whoops, did not mean to do that. Let's see if I can fix that real quick because I can't imagine you guys are wanting to see nothing but me, not that I can blame you. Okay, there we go. So a couple of characteristics of blood that we want to go ahead and get out of the way, some of which are not really going to be that surprising. Uh, so blood is viscous. So uh, I think I've asked you guys this before, but I think I asked you to kind of give me an example of something that is viscous. So a lot of people come up with things like honey or syrup or things like that. So those are all good examples. So blood is viscous. So something that is viscous uh, has a resistance to flow. So Water is not very viscous. So if you have a glass of water and you tip the cup over, the water is going to come straight out. It has a very small resistance to flow. However, if you have a jar of honey or a jar of syrup and you try to pour it out, it's going to come out very slowly. So blood is a lot more like syrup more so than water. So blood shows this resistance to flow, which of course is going to as we'll talk about in chapter 19, underlie the importance of having a strong heart pumping mechanism to circulate that blood. Understanding that because of this characteristic of the blood, uh, blood isn't going to necessarily be so easy to pump around. So we're definitely going to need to have a strong mechanism to do that. Uh, so blood is fairly warm. So blood is usually maintained at a temperature of a little bit above uh, your core body temperature. So about 38 degrees Celsius. 
So we want the blood to be fairly warm because, as we've already mentioned, we can regulate blood flow, promote blood flow to certain places, decrease blood flow to others for the sake of regulating skin temperature to make sure that your skin doesn't get too hot or too cold. And we can do that for a variety of other places as well. Uh, the blood is slightly basic if we're talking about pH. So most of your uh, bodily fluids other than blood, so we're really talking mostly about intracellular fluids, uh, you might expect them to have kind of a neutral pH, so a pH at right at 7. Uh, so it turns out that your blood's pH is actually slightly basic, so it has a set point of about 7.40, which of course is slightly basic. So we, for reasons that we will not really discuss until we start talking about respiration, we absolutely want to have blood maintained at this basic pH. As we will eventually find out, there would be catastrophic consequences for the blood pH to get too high or too low. But as we've talked about before, way back when, uh, anytime you have a system in which you do not want the pH of that system to change too much, you need to have a buffer system. So blood is buffered by a number of different chemicals found in the blood, including phosphates, carbonates, and the hemoglobin itself. And we'll talk about those sorts of things in due time. So if we talk about the blood plasma's composition, we've already taken a very kind of superficial overview of some of those uh, formed elements. So uh, over 90% of the blood plasma is just water itself. So the remaining 10% is therefore going to consist of any solutes that we find. Uh, so that will include proteins, which include uh, carrier proteins like albumins, uh, globulins and antibodies, and then clotting factors, etc. So albumins and other uh, uh, carrier proteins are going to function in uh, distributing and carrying uh, insoluble and hydrophobic molecules like steroid hormones, lipids, etc. throughout the blood. And then globulins and antibodies Antibodies will function in your immune defense, and then clotting factors will circulate in the case that you injure yourself and you need to quickly have a response to seal a ruptured blood vessel. Uh, salt, so this includes sodium and potassium, which we've talked about a billion times before. Don't forget that uh, the blood plasma is an extracellular fluid, so it will have a high concentration of sodium and a relatively low concentration of potassium. Uh, calcium, uh, a fairly rich amount of calcium, especially compared to intracellular fluids, of which there's hardly any. Uh, chloride, bicarbonate, which we already mentioned is involved in pH buffering in the blood plasma. And then other examples, we could go on and on and on with that. Uh, dissolved gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide, so we'll have a really good discussion on those when we start talking respiration. Nitrogen to a small extent, not because nitrogen is necessarily super duper important, but because almost 80% of the atmosphere is nitrogen anyway, so naturally when we breathe in, we're going to get some of that nitrogen in the blood, but it's pretty innocuous, so no big deal there. Uh, and then finally, nutrients and metabolic waste. We've talked a whole bunch about the importance of regulating your blood glucose, so it should not be a surprise that there is glucose there. Fatty acids, which of course are hydrophobic and will need to be carried around by some of those carrier proteins in the plasma. Uh, amino acids, vitamins, urea waste products, etc. So there's a lot kind of going on in the blood plasma, but don't forget that most of the blood plasma is just water. And definitely don't forget that it is a solution that has a given osmolarity, which if that osmolarity changes, that's going to have dire consequences on some of those formed elements, whether they swell up or whether they shrivel up. Uh, so we won't spend too much time kind of going through this uh, table that is in your book, but basically this just kind of gives you a good breakdown of some of the different things that you can kind of tend to expect to find in uh, both the whole blood, the blood plasma, and then in the formed elements. So speaking of the formed elements, let's take a little bit of a closer look at some of those. So most of the formed elements, keeping in mind these are cells, they are highly ephemeral. So that's kind of a fancy, uh, fancy word, right? Ephemeral. So what does ephemeral mean? So if something is ephemeral, that means that it is not going to last for very long. It is kind of fleeting. It shows up and then it goes away fairly quickly. 
if we're talking about cells being ephemeral, we mean that they're not going to have a very long lifespan. Once they are formed from stem cells, they will live a very short life before they are disposed of or die off in some particular way. So because most of these formed elements are ephemeral, this means that they have to be regenerated on a fairly regular basis. And the process that we use for this is called hematopoiesis, something that we have talked about before. So going back to chapter six, when we talked about bone physiology, we mentioned that most of our hematopoiesis takes place in the red marrow of spongy cancellous bone. So let's talk about hematopoiesis in just a slightly more detailed fashion than we did before. So hematopoiesis is the process of certain types of stem cells, which are called hemocytoblasts, which are contained within that red bone, bone marrow. They are capable of differentiating into a number of different types of cells. They are what we call multipotent stem cells. They have the capability of differentiating and specializing into a number of different things. Recall that most cells in the body are what we call unipotent, meaning they only have the capability to become one very specific thing. So hemocytoblasts are very diverse. They can really differentiate into a number of different things. They are very flexible that way. But what they differentiate into is going to depend on what type of growth factor are they being stimulated with. So a growth factor is just a type of signaling molecule that will bind to a receptor on the hemocytoblast and direct it to become a certain type of cell. Some growth factors are going to be hormones. In fact, a lot of them are. Some of them may be neurotransmitters. Some of them may be paracrine or autocrine signals. It's just going to depend. So what the hemocytoblast differentiates into is ultimately going to depend on what type of growth factor, what type of hematopoietic growth factor it is being stimulated with. Uh, so this is a flow chart that we have looked at before just to kind of give you an idea of all the different types of cells that we can generate through hematopoiesis. Specifically, we want to point out a few different things. Keeping in mind, we will talk about all these different types of cells in good time. So let's not get too hung up on that just yet. So a hemocytoblast, which you can see up here, has two major types of lineages that it can differentiate into. And we appropriately have two different types of uh, growth factors that we can use to either go into one lineage or another. The first lineage is called a myeloid lineage, and this is going to be the pathway that we will take in order to get red blood cells and then a good number of our different white blood cells and platelets. The other lineage is called the lymphoid lineage. This will give us very specific types of white blood cells called T and B lymphocytes as well as natural killer T cells. So again, we will skip over this, float, uh, this table right here because we will cover all of this information as we go along here. So as I was talking about these hematopoietic growth factors, so each type of formed element, as I said, generally has some type of growth factor that will be responsible for its production through hematopoiesis. For example, if we need more red blood cells, the growth factor we are going to use is called EPO or erythropoietin, something that we have talked about before. It is a hormone, a glycoprotein hormone that is produced by the kidneys in response to low systemic levels of oxygen. So we definitely don't want to forget kind of our roots in this class of the homeostasis loop that we have talked about so much before. A stimulus would be low oxygen, then we would have a sensor for that in the kidneys, which would also be our control center. The EPO would be our output signal, and then the effector in this case will be those hemocytoblasts, the stem cells that will respond to this EPO output signal. And our response will, of course, be the increased ability to carry oxygen with these new erythrocytes that we are going to make. Thrombopoietin is another type of hormone which is produced by both the kidneys and the liver, which stimulates those hemocytoblasts to differentiate into a different part of the myeloid lineage, a large cell called a megakaryocyte. So megakaryocyte, it just sounds like a very, very big cell, and it is. So it turns out that the platelets that we're going to talk about they are not actually cells themselves, even though they are called thrombocytes. 
A platelet is not really a cell. It is a fragment of a cell. Thrombocytes or platelets are actually just little fragments or pieces of an entire megakaryocyte. So keep it in mind, they are not actual cells. They are just little pieces of cells that we will see will function in the blood clotting process. And then a variety of other different types of growth factors will include cytokines, which are usually going to be autocrine and paracrine signals, which can stimulate the production of various other types of white blood cells, whether it be in the myeloid or lymphoid lineage, it's just going to depend a little bit. So let's focus on kind of the most, I would argue, the most important type of formed element for the time being, at least most important given the unit that we are in. So let's talk about our red blood cells, which are more appropriately called erythrocytes. So red blood cells are all over the place. These are by far the most numerous of the formed elements that we will talk about, and that should not be a surprise given the hematocrit that we talked about. The biggest component of the formed elements was definitely the red blood cells. So per microliter of blood, how much is a microliter? So a microliter is one one thousandth of a milliliter, and a milliliter is one one thousandth of a liter. So we're talking about one times 10 to the minus sixth liter. So very, very small amount of fluid. There are anywhere between four to six million of these red blood cells per microliter of blood. And if you consider that the average person has about five to six liters of blood in their body, that is a lot of oxygen carrying power that we get from our erythrocytes. So like I said, we have about five million of them in every microliter. Uh, obviously the most notable function get, uh, due to their uh, uh, characteristic of containing hemoglobin, which binds to and carries oxygen, their most notable function, of course, is to transport oxygen throughout the blood from the time oxygen enters the body through the pulmonary arteries in the lungs to the time it is unloaded in the systemic capillaries. So we're talking about all the different places that need oxygen throughout the body. So hemoglobin, as we said, is the a functional carrier of oxygen in red blood cells, and it is really what accounts for its our overwhelming ability to transport a lot of oxygen throughout the body, and as we will eventually see, to a much lesser extent, carbon dioxide. Uh, so one other thing to take note of here, I mentioned that most of these formed elements are ephemeral. The lifespan of a red blood cell is only approximately 120 days, so really just about four months. Uh, so red blood cells live for about four months and then they are destroyed. So we have to just constantly regenerate red blood cells by hematopoiesis. And of course, our kidneys help regulate this by sensing and responding to momentary lapses in our ability to carry oxygen so that we can sense when it is the right time to get ourselves more red blood cells. So let's take just a quick little look at hemoglobin here, and we'll talk a lot more about hemoglobin once we really start talking about respiration. So this will not be the first, or, the, or this will not be the last time that we talk about hemoglobin. So red blood cells, we already mentioned, carry an abundance of these large molecular complexes of protein and pigment, which are called hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, it is important to mention, is not a singular protein. It is actually a conglomeration of four different proteins in a quaternary configuration. So these proteins are called globins. And for a adult hemoglobin complex, you are going to have two alpha globins, which you can see down here, alpha number one and alpha number two. And then you are going to have two beta globins. Each one of those globins complexes with a chromophore pigment molecule called heme. That heme contains and coordinates a singular atom of iron. Iron, as it turns out, has a high affinity for oxygen. So the fact that these globin molecules coordinate a heme for each of them allows us to bind to and carry oxygen throughout the blood. So if we do a quick little bit of math here, if every hemoglobin contains four globins, and if every globin contains one heme, and if every one heme can bind to one molecule of oxygen, this means that every hemoglobin complex can bind to and carry up to four molecules of oxygen.
So if we continue on with a little bit of math here, if each hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules, and if there are about 300 million hemoglobin molecules per red blood cell, and from what we learned before, if there are about 5 million red blood cells per microliter of blood, and if there's 1,000 microliters per milliliter, 1,000 milliliters per liter, and we have about 5 liters in our body, we're not going to bother doing the whole math itself. What you need to know about that is that is a ton of oxygen carrying power. So what we're eventually going to learn with respiration here in a while, uh, there should not be any reason ever for a healthy functioning person to ever start to run out of oxygen. We have way too much capacity for carrying it around. But something that we should go ahead and understand before we ever get there is that the vast majority of any oxygen that you find in the blood is going to be carried by hemoglobin. It is true that some amount of oxygen can be directly dissolved in the blood plasma. So if we go backwards here for just a second to our discussion on the blood plasma, we had mentioned here that some things that you expect to find in the blood plasma are dissolved gases like oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen. When we say dissolved gases, we mean that these things are directly dissolved in the blood plasma. So they are literally solutes. If you have a dissolved gas in the blood plasma, it is not being carried by anything. It is just acting all by itself. So if we come back to right here, it's not very much, but some oxygen is freely dissolved in the blood plasma and not being carried by hemoglobin. What this picture that you're looking at here is meant to demonstrate is that there is some oxygen being carried in the blood all by itself, but it is fairly insignificant when you compare it to that that is carried by hemoglobin. And this will be a concept that we definitely revisit again when we get into respiration. So we definitely understand that the whole purpose of hemoglobin is to carry oxygen throughout the circulation and deliver it to needy cells and tissues. So you have tissues like skeletal muscle, like heart muscle, like brain tissue, all sorts of tissues throughout the body that need oxygen in order to survive. We need that oxygen in order to produce a lot of ATP through cellular respiration. So what we're going to find out when we get to chapter 19, or excuse me, chapter 20, which is going to talk about different types of blood vessels, but we can go ahead and uh, kind of briefly introduce it now. Most of our arteries, which are very large blood vessels in our body, most of our arteries are going to carry oxygen-rich blood. So the hemoglobin that you find in most arteries is going to be carrying oxygen. So we call that oxyhemoglobin. Arteries will eventually simplify into a capillary network. Capillaries are going to basically infiltrate into organ and tissue, and that is going to be where we deliver our oxygen. So if you look at the color coding here, red meaning oxygen rich and blue meaning oxygen poor, the fact that as we go through this capillary network, we go from red to pink to blue, pretty much tells us that we progressively lose the oxygen from the arteries as we go into the veins. So what is happening here is that the oxygen being carried by the hemoglobin gets let go of, the hemoglobin lets go of the oxygen when it gets into the capillaries, and then a good amount of hemoglobin that comes out on the other side is no longer carrying oxygen. That hemoglobin will need to migrate to the capillaries and the lungs to pick up more oxygen from the next time that we breathe. So that will be something that we definitely talk about in greater detail later. Okay, so hemoglobin is also capable of transporting a small amount of carbon dioxide through the blood. So we're not going to talk about this a whole bunch right now. We will eventually talk about how hemoglobin binds to carbon dioxide to help us do a number of things, including regulating how and when we release our oxygen. We can regulate the pH of the blood, but I want to talk about a specific type of case study right now. So to understand how carbon dioxide actually does this, carbon dioxide, which is like oxygen in some cases, freely dissolved in the blood. 
So gases do not freely dissolve in the blood very well. There will be a small amount of it, but there's a limit to how much it can happen. So in order for us to transport a large amount of carbon dioxide waste around, our red blood cells use an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Carbon dioxide can combine with a molecule of water to form something that is actually dissolvable in, uh, in water. So carbon dioxide is hydrophobic. It can't really dissolve in water very well. So if we convert it to carbonic acid, which is hydrophilic because it is an acid and therefore ionic, uh, it will dissolve in the blood plasma. And then it will dissociate into a hydrogen ion, which most acids do, and then a molecule of bicarbonate. So that resulting bicarbonate can then attach itself to hemoglobin through an arginine amino acid, and this results in a type of hemoglobin that is not really going to bind to oxygen anymore because it is occupied with binding to carbonic acid, or excuse me, to bicarbonate. So we call that carbaminohemoglobin. So carbaminohemoglobin is going to have a much lower affinity for oxygen. So it turns out that a very useful way of us delivering oxygen when we need to is for us to do so in areas that have a lot of carbon dioxide. And that will be something that we talk about in much greater detail when we get to respiration, as I've already said many times before. So here's the case study I wanted to talk about. I'm sure you are aware that carbon monoxide is no bueno, right? So it's not a good thing. So carbon monoxide can also bind to hemoglobin in the same way that oxygen does. But here is the problem. Carbon monoxide has a much, much, much higher affinity for oxygen than does, uh, hemo or than does oxygen. Carbon monoxide has a much easier time binding to hemoglobin than so does oxygen. I said it again just because I think there was something wrong with the way I said it before. So basically from hemoglobin's perspective, it would much rather bind to carbon monoxide than oxygen. So that is kind of a problem for us because we understand that the whole purpose of hemoglobin is it's supposed to be transporting oxygen throughout the body. So that's not very good. So we definitely want to avoid he uh, carbon monoxide if we can help it. So if we put a number to this, hemoglobin has about a 210-fold greater affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen. Basically, what that means, to put it into layman's terms, imagine that you've got a single complex of hemoglobin, so one hemoglobin molecule, essentially. You've also got one carbon monoxide molecule and 210 molecules of oxygen. 210 molecules of oxygen and one carbon monoxide. With this situation, hemoglobin would have about a 50-50 chance of either going for one of the oxygens or that one carbon monoxide. So this is a big, big, big problem. So general treatment for carbon monoxide poisoning, whether it comes from poor house ventilation, cigarette smoking, or something else, usually involves hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So I laid out that situation in which you have 210 molecules of oxygen for every heme uh, for every carbon monoxide well with hyperbaric oxygen therapy in which you are essentially breathing 100 percent oxygen for a short amount of time you greatly increase the amount of oxygen in the body and you basically trick the hemoglobin into settling for oxygen rather than the carbon monoxide so I actually have a, uh, another picture that I wanted to show here, but I forgot to put it into these slides. So I'll make sure that you guys see that eventually, whether it's in a collaborate meeting or in some other fashion. It's a pretty funny picture that kind of helps you understand the carbon monoxide situation a little bit better. So I'll make sure you guys see that in due time. So be looking forward to that. It's, it's pretty funny. Okay, so let's move on to the erythrocyte life cycle. I mentioned, of course, that most of your formed elements are ephemeral, meaning that they don't stick around for very long. So red blood cells have a life cycle of about 120 days. So the way we are going to regenerate them is with hematopoiesis, specifically by using the hormone EPO.
So we already kind of covered this. So cells within the kidneys, which measure areas of the arteries that feed in through the renal artery, where blood flow is very high, are going to measure oxygen saturation. When these oxygen levels fall below the normal range, uh, these cells will respond by synthesizing and secreting this EPO hormone. EPO is a hormone, so it travels through the blood to the red bone marrow of cancellous bone, whether it be in the ends of long bones or in more commonly flat bones. Uh, EPO will stimulate those hemocytoblasts to start generating new red blood cells to allow for increased oxygen transport. So something that you definitely, I would suggest, uh, recommend doing on your own is chart out everything that is happening here in terms of a homeostasis loop, starting with the stimulus, input signal, output signal, sensor, control center, and all that good stuff. So make sure that you can chart everything that is happening there. It's something I probably will ask about later. And then of course, like any good homeostasis loop, it will be shut off via your classical negative feedback mechanisms. So I mentioned that red blood cells will live for about four months before they are eventually disposed of. After about 120 days, they just don't do their job very well anymore. So it's probably better to get rid of cells that aren't doing their job well anymore rather than allowing them to kind of stick around and continue struggling. So macrophages, which are a special type of phagocytizing cell that circulate throughout the body, uh, they will glom on to these old and damaged red blood cells and degrade them by phagocytosis. So something you should definitely go ahead and think about, I'm not going to give away the answer, or am I? No, I'm not going to give away the answer quite yet. Uh, think about what organelle a macrophage would have that would probably be responsible for degrading red blood cells that are engulfed by phagocytosis. So be thinking about that we can possibly discuss that during our collaborate sessions. Uh, so the globin chains of hemoglobin are going to naturally be broken down into their substituent amino acids, just like any protein is broken down when by, done so by hydrolysis. And then those amino acids can, of course, be reused in the future synthesis of new hemoglobin or other types of proteins. The tricky thing here in terms of kind of recycling things is the heme, particularly those iron atoms. So the iron atoms within the heme aren't really going to be degraded. You cannot degrade a single atom because atoms by definition can't be broken down into simpler units. So the iron atoms within heme are going to be taken out and stored within either the liver or the spleen or circulated throughout the blood by a iron transporting protein called transferrin. So if certain types of carrier proteins are capable of transporting hydrophobic molecules, think of transferrin as something that can transport iron around in the blood. And then any remainder parts of the heme other than the iron are going to be metabolized into waste products called biliverdin and bilirubin, which can be actually used for a number of different things, such as the production of bile in uh, uh, different parts of the digestive system, particularly uh, the, uh, uh, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder, of course. So this uh, flowchart here just kind of summarizes what I just talked about. It's a little bit busy in ter as far as flowcharts go, so I'm not going to cover every single last bit of this, but what you might want to spend a couple minutes doing is just kind of flipping back and forth between this slide and the previous slide just to kind of make sure that everything I talked about jives with what you see represented here in this slide. So interesting little case study that I always like to talk about uh, around this time is sickle cell anemia. And this is especially important to talk about given that we just got done talking about red blood cells and hemoglobin. So we've already talked about hemoglobin in the sense that it is comprised of four globin subunits, four different polypeptide chains that are arranged in a quaternary structure. So you are probably aware of sickle cell anemia in which case the red blood cells, which are usually uh, shaped as biconcave discs, kind of like little donuts that haven't had the holes removed yet, uh, 
With sickle cell anemia, this is named as such because these red blood cells kind of tend to elongate into these kind of jagged sickle shapes, of course. So what causes sickle cell anemia? You might be aware that it is a genetic disorder. The result of a genetic mutation in the beta globin gene. So people who have the sickle cell trait uh, have an error in their DNA sequence which, which codes for the beta globin protein and this beta globin protein will uh, start really misbehaving when it is not bound to oxygen and it will tend to become uh, very hydrophobic and it tends to polymerize into these kind of long fibrous chains kind of like keratin or collagen. So these fibers cause the plasma membrane of the red blood cell to really stretch out into this kind of long jagged shape and the problem here is kind of multifold. Number one, these red blood cells are going to have a very hard time carrying oxygen around because those beta globins are not really doing their job and especially they're going to have a hard time passing through capillaries. We will talk about this in chapter 20, but capillaries are very, very narrow. They're essentially only narrow enough for one red blood cell to make it through at a time. So if you picture red blood cells making its way through capillaries, they tend to do so in single file line. So if one of these kind of jagged numbers tries to fit through, it may clog up the capillary and even cause a type of hemorrhage. Uh, so one very common way of treating sickle cell anemia is with a drug called hydroxyurea, which basically will reprogram some of the cells in the body to start producing a different type of globin called gamma globin, which is actually not a adult globin, but rather a fetal globin. So basically we reprogram the red blood cells to start using this globin that we have not used since we were very, very, very young. It doesn't quite do the same uh, as good of a job as the beta globin when it is healthy, but it's certainly going to be better than a damaged and mutated beta globin would. So let's talk a little bit more about that mutation that we talked about. So there is actually only one very specific mutation that causes sickle cell anemia. We call this a point mutation. A point mutation happens when only one codon in the DNA sequence changes its nucleotide. Here, the normal nucleotide, which usually should be coding for a glutamate amino acid within the primary sequence of the protein, it instead mutates from thymine to, al uh, to uh, adenine. So this change from CTC codon to CAC codon changes the amino acid that's coded for from glutamate to valine. That may not seem like a big deal, it's just one amino acid change. But don't forget our protein folding lab that we did way earlier in the semester when you were trying to fold that protein so that all the hydrophilic amino acids matched up, all the hydrophobic amino acids matched up, all the electrostatic acid and basic amino acids matched up. So what we're doing here is we are changing a glutamate, which is a hydrophilic acidic amino acid, so it should either be exposed out to the extracellular fluid or it should be matched up with a basic amino acid like lysine or arginine. We are changing that to valine, which is a hydrophobic amino acid. So what do you know about things that are hydrophobic? What do they not like? They do not like water. So that glutamate which should have been exposed to the water, the whole protein is now going to change the way it folds so that we can bury that valine away from the water. And this change in protein shape is ultimately what is responsible for the beta globin no longer behaving the way that it is supposed to. Another thing that is very, very interesting, this is probably a discussion that would probably be better suited for either a genetics class or a general biology class more so than physiology, but it's so interesting that I can't help but bring it up. So you are probably at least somewhat aware that uh, people who have the sickle cell trait are more than likely going to be from Africa or have some African descent, right? So it turns out that there's a very good reason for this. There's a very good reason why the sickle cell trait persists even though it seems like an overwhelmingly bad thing. Usually with bad 
disease-causing genes, we expect them to cause some sort of mortality so that that gene kind of makes its way out of the gene pool over time. That's just evolution and natural selection at work. Well, there is actually a very good reason why the sickle cell trait sticks around and why it seems to affect mostly people of African descent. What it has to do with is it has to do with malaria. So malaria is a type of disease that most commonly affects regions of Central and Western Africa, or excuse me, of Central and kind of uh, Northeast and Western Africa. So if you look at these two maps right here, you can see where malaria is most prevalent. You can also look at this map to see how prevalent the sickle cell trait is in different regions of Africa. The most common places you find it are going to have a great deal of overlap with where you also find places with malaria. So what this tells us is that there must be a good reason why you want to have the sickle cell trait in places where there is also general outbreaks of malaria. It turns out that people that have the sickle cell trait, just one of the alleles, not both of them, if you have two sickle cell alleles, you have full-blown sickle cell anemia, and that's going to be a very, very bad deal. If you have just one sickle cell allele and the other one is healthy, you have the sickle cell trait, and it's not going to be great for you, but you'll, you'll mostly be okay. That one sickle cell trait actually confers resistance against the malaria, uh, the parasite that causes malaria. So, this would explain why it's actually a good thing to have the sickle cell trait in places that are prone to malaria outbreaks. This is a concept that is generally talked about in biology classes called heterozygote advantage. And if you're interested in it, I definitely recommend you read up on it. Okay, so at this point, we are pretty much done talking about red blood cells. So let's finish up and talk about the other types of formed elements that you find in the blood as well. We're not going to talk about these in nearly as much detail. We're actually not going to get a chance because of our shortened semester, because of the COVID-19. We're not going to get a chance to talk about the immune system. So we're going to have to make do with what we're able to talk about here. So white blood cells, we are aware, are far less abundant than the red blood cells. They're less than 1% of the whole blood. So white blood cells, far less abundant. They do not function in oxygen transport in any way, but what they do function in is immune defense. So white blood cells, keeping in mind they're not very common in the blood, they're just kind of floating around here and there, they are attracted to paracrine signals that are either given off by sites of injury or by bacteria and pathogens that infiltrate into an injury site. So over here in this figure on the right side, you can see someone that has experienced a wound. Uh, so that provides a way for bacteria to make their way into the body those bacteria will start producing these paracrine and autocrine, or just paracrine signals that will act as a attractant through what we call chemotaxis that attracts the white blood cells to the area of injury. But here's the deal here. Look at what's going on here. The bacteria are not in the blood. They're just kind of around in the tissue. So the white blood cells are in the bloodstream. So how exactly are the white blood cells going to leave the bloodstream to get into the tissue? So white blood cells can leave the bloodstream altogether through a process called diapodesis, which is also sometimes called extravasation. So think about this. So this can be another thing that we talk about uh, in our collaborate session. How in the world are these white blood cells going to move through the vascular uh, endothelial cells, those cells that make up the wall of the blood vessel? So keep in mind, there is some very special property that most blood vessels in our body have that some blood vessels, say in the brain and the spinal cord, do not have something that would allow a white blood cell to squeeze through. So be thinking about that, and if you want to discuss it in our collaborate session, we certainly can do so. Uh, so white blood cells can be classified on the basis of whether they are granular or agranular. Granular white blood cells have very visible little speckles inside the cytoplasm, which usually are going to be either some type of 
excuse me, some a type of stored enzyme or something similar. And then you can also identify white blood cells on the basis of what their nucleus looks like. So some of these nuclei don't really look that strange, but some of these nuclei definitely look a little bit funky. We call these sometimes bilobed or trilobed nuclei. So really all I'm going to ask you to do here with these white blood cells is make sure that you understand which ones are the most common and which ones are the least common. So the mnemonic device that we use for this is never let monkeys eat bananas. It sounds ridiculous, but it works. Never let monkeys eat bananas. It starts with the white blood cell that is most common and most prevalent with the N, which stands for neutrophils. Then as you go from left to right through the mnemonic, the white blood cells become less and less common. So N for neutrophils, L for lymphocytes, M for monocytes, E for eosinophils, and B for basophils. So with that mnemonic vise, you should be in good shape there. So the granules that we were talking about are going to contain either some type of enzyme, some type of protein, something that is either going to be important to the ability of that white blood cell to combat infection. In one case with lysozyme, that is an enzyme that can destroy the bacterial cell wall or something that has to do with inflammatory responses. In some cases, histamines, histamines that can stimulate an allergic reaction we are familiar with. Uh, notably, a type of lymphocyte called B lymphocytes are going to be responsible for antibody production, and we'll have more to say on that a little bit later. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about platelets or thrombocytes. So I mentioned before that platelets are just little fragments of a very large cell called a megakaryocyte. Uh, our hematopoietic stem cells, those hemocytoblasts, will differentiate into megakaryocytes when they're stimulated with thrombopoietin, either from the liver or the kidneys. So any platelets that we do not need can be stored in the spleen for immediate delivery when needed. So this is really not unlike glycogen storage in the liver. We can tap into glucose when we need it there. We can tap into platelets when we need it in the spleen. Uh, so platelets function in hemostasis, basically the, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Basically the act of trying to keep the blood in the body and try to keep the blood normal. So if we have some sort of blood loss due to some type of injury, platelets are going to precipitate the clotting process to prevent any further loss of blood from damaged blood vessels. We're not going to talk about this in super great detail, but we will get some of the basics here. So upon injury, platelets have to be activated and recruited to the site of injury, very similar to how the white blood cells were recruited to sites of bacterial infection. And we do this with a number of different clotting factors. So when a vascular injury occurs, so if you cut yourself, you've almost certainly severed some blood vessels, most of which are going to be capillaries, so it's not that huge a deal. You're not going to die from just a little scrape on the surface of the skin. But it's something that we definitely want to repair, and we repair that with our platelets. So when a vascular injury occurs, certain components of the blood are going to leak out into the interstitial fluid. I should have corrected this because the blood is a type of extracellular fluid, so it's a little confusing. Blood components leak into the interstitial fluid is what I meant to put there. So this injured blood vessel, which contains smooth muscle, is going to start spasming. Basically, the smooth muscle is going to vasoconstrict to prevent any further loss of blood through that particular pathway. So we eventually use the smooth muscle to temporarily seal off any further blood from leaking out through the opening. So kind of think of it in terms of something like a traffic detour. We basically put up a whole bunch of traffic cones where the injury is and any blood that, try to that tries to make it through is gonna have to find a way around. So, Clotting factors, which were in the blood plasma and have leaked out into the interstitial fluid, are going to activate, activate nearby platelets, which will clump together and form a plug that seals up where those traffic cones are, where the vascular spasm has occurred, to plug it up and prevent any further blood loss. But so far, this is still just a temporary fix. Think of something like duct tape. 
So the more permanent fix is a, progress, a process called coagulation, which involves a, kind of a complicated cascade of events that we're not really going to get into, involving a number of different clotting factors that will result in the synthesis of kind of a meshwork of a protein called fibrin that will seal up the injury and provide a fix on a more permanent basis. So your book mentions a number of different clotting factors of which there are quite a few of them. I cannot stress this enough. Do not try to memorize those clotting factors. I am not going to ask about specific clotting factors. If I ask about anything, it is going to be just about the general process that, process that we just got done talking about. So just to give you an, uh, kind of an idea of some drugs that are involved in blood clotting, uh, some of them you may have heard of before, Heparin is an anticoagulant that opposes clotting factor number two. And it, I, again, don't memorize the clotting factors, but I'm just providing you a little context on what some of these drugs do specifically. Uh, warfarin is an anticoagulant that reduces the amount of vitamin K that is available for other clotting factor reactions. So vitamin K is absolutely essential for your blood clotting, so make sure you eat foods that are rich in vitamin K. Uh, aspirin, which is an NSAID that is available over the counter, it can act as an anticoagulant by inhibiting an enzyme called cyclooxygenase 1, which is an enzyme that produces molecules called thromboxanes that are necessary for platelet aggregation. So there are certainly other examples other than just these three, but they are three kind of common ones that you may have heard of before. So drugs like these are very useful for preventing either thrombi or emboli, which are aggregates of either platelets or other sorts of things like red blood cells and other materials, which can clog up the circulation and cause either heart, attract, heart attacks or strokes based on what arteries those thrombi or emboli, uh, where they kind of get stuck and cause their problems. So. If someone is on anticoagulant ma medication like warfarin or something else, what do you think is their biggest risk factor? What is the biggest risk of prescribing someone so something like heparin or warfarin? So again, be thinking about that. We can definitely talk about it during our collaborate session, but I think the answer there should be pretty obvious. So something that is interesting, it's not necessarily that big of an issue these days, but this is kind of a nice historical little context conversation for us to have. So hemophilia, so something that I hope you've heard of before, this is basically a disease of blood clotting. This is, it's historically been called the bleeder's disease. So hemophilia is an X-linked recessive genetic disease in which a person cannot make sufficient quantities of clotting factor number eight. So uh, if you don't happen to remember your general biology or your genetics or your Mendelian inheritance or anything like that, I'll go ahead and help you out here. Who are going to be the most affected individuals for an X-linked genetic disease? Well, just look at this pedigree chart that you see right here. You'll notice that all of the affected individuals, which are shaded in yellow, are men. So what this means is that the gene responsible for the production of clotting factor number eight is on the X chromosome. If you have one bad copy of the X chromosome, if you are a female, it's not that big a deal. You have another X chromosome which can compensate for that. If you are a man, that one bad copy of clotting factor number eight is the only copy you've got because you've only got one X chromosome. Your other chromosome that matches up with it is a Y chromosome and it does not have a gene for clotting factor number eight. So for this reason, oh, whoops. Uh, so for this reason, affected individuals for hemophilia are almost exclusively men. So this pedigree chart, I mentioned that this is kind of a historical case study. This was a big problem when different kingdoms and dynasties throughout Europe in the early, early days of the 14th, 15th, and so on centuries, they would arrange marriages between princesses and princes and other uh, royalty of different countries like England and Spain and France and places like that. 
And you can see how some of these arranged marriages produces produced cases of hemophilia. This is not so much a problem these days because a lot of these marriages were arranged and a lot of the marriages and interbreeding happen uh, in consanguineous fashion, meaning that oftentimes you had first cousins marrying together. So you didn't really have a chance to dilute some of these genes out by marrying people that are not already your family. It's kind of a weird topic of conversation to have, but there you go. Okay, so the last conversation that we are going to have in this chapter is a very useful one and kind of a fun one to have. In fact, next, me next week we are actually going to do an activity. I haven't decided whether it's the lab or the homework assignment yet. Excuse me. Uh, we're going to have a activity on blood typing. So I'll go ahead and teach you how to type blood here. So, of course, you are probably aware that blood and tissue transfusions can't just be done willy-nilly, right? We have to take care to make sure that blood and tissue are transfused into people that meet specific eligibility requirements. So it turns out that these eligibility requirements that we're talking about here have everything to do with two things antigens and antibodies. So antibodies, we have already talked about, are produced by B lymphocytes. An antibody is a multi-subunit protein that has a high affinity for something called an antigen. An antigen can be just about anything. It can be any type of molecule that binds to an antibody, but most typically antigens are going to be proteins themselves. Not always, but usually. So in immunity, when a particular antigen is recognized by an antibody, the antigen probably comes from a foreign pathogen like a bacteria, bacterium or a virus or a fungus. Antibodies circulating throughout the blood bind to these antigens and serves as a catalyst to recruit white blood cells to the area. In cell recognition, which is what we're going to talk about here with blood typing, Native cells, the cells of your own body, present antigens on the surface of their plasma membranes that are not going to be recognized by that person's own antibodies, so there shouldn't be a problem. So it prevents the immune system from attacking the body's own cells. So in blood typing, which is, again, we're talking about a type of cell recognition, we are going to be considering antigens that are presented on the surface of red blood cells. These antigens come in three basic varieties. The A antigen, the B antigen, and the RH factor, or rhesus factor, which again is another type of antigen. So this is going to form the basis for the ABO blood typing system and the RH system, both of which coexist together and both of which we are going to have to be cognizant of when determining someone's blood type and when determining when someone can and cannot receive blood. So different type of people are going to have these three antigens in a variety of different combinations. Some people may have only one of those three antigens there, so someone may have just the A antigen but not the other two, someone may have the B antigen but not the other two, and so on. Some people may have all three of them, some people may have two of them, or some people may have none of them at all. All those different possible combinations are going to determine what someone's blood type is. So the combination of those antigens that you've got on your red blood cells right now is what determines your blood type. In this chart that you see right here, you can see an overview of what generally seems to be the most common blood type. So generally, the most common blood type among all different types of people is O positive. We will talk about the implications of O positive later on. Some people tend to have more commonly B positive, such as Asian Americans and African Americans. Uh, a positive tends to kind of overall be the second most po uh, prevalent blood type. But you can see, based on the combinations of different types of antigens that we have, we get a total of eight different basic types of blood. So for instance, to determine someone's blood type, you really just need to consider what antigen they have. And the way you do this is usually pretty self-explanatory. If you have just the A antigen and nothing else, you are type A. The 
the positive or the negative comes in here based on the rhesus factor. So if a person has the A antigen only, no B antigens and no rhesus factor, they are what we would call type A negative. A person who has all three antigens, A, B, and RH, is what we would call AB positive. AB because they have A and B, and positive because they've got the RH. And then a person who only has the RH antigen, as an example, would be O positive, which again is the most common blood type. So when you're considering who may or may not donate blood to whomever else, what you're considering here is not just the antigens that are on the red blood cells that are going to be donated. You are also considering the antibodies in the blood plasma of the person that is receiving the blood. So two things you're considering. What antigens are being donated? What antibodies are already there in the person that is going to be receiving those red blood cells? So here's the rule of thumb for any given person if you know their blood type. If you have a particular antigen, your blood plasma is going to not have that particular antibody. So if you are type A and you've got A antigens, your own blood plasma is not going to have anti-A antibodies, the type of antibody that binds to A antigens. If you do not have a particular antigen, the corresponding antibody will be present in your plasma. So if you are A negative, meaning all you have is the A, A antigen, your plasma will contain both anti-B and anti-RH antibodies, meaning you do not want to be receiving a transfusion from someone who is either type B or uh, positive for anything, for the RH factor, that is. So for a few examples, a person who is type A negative, like I said, will have both anti-B antibodies and anti-RH antibodies in their blood plasma. So do this on your own for someone who is type AB positive or O negative. Make sure you can tell what antigens they have and what antibodies they have. So why is it such a big deal that we want to avoid an antigen in encountering its corresponding antibody? So when matching antibodies and antigens come together, the red blood cells are going to clump together. Basically consider that antigen and antibody coming together, serving as a catalyst for everything kind of all nucleating and clumping together. This is a process that is very problematic called hemagglutination. Agglutinated red blood cells are a big problem. They basically just serve as a big ball of red blood cells that is going to do nothing but cause problems for us. It can cut off the circulation and block blood flow to more important vessels. And additionally, those red blood cells are going to get broken down by leukocytes and all the released junk that gets released off of it can get to the kidneys and cause them to fail. But here's the deal. Hemagglutination is going to be extremely useful to us in actually determining someone's blood type. We're not going to get agglutination to happen inside the person. Rather, we're going to get it to happen outside their body where it's not going to cause them any problems. So this is what blood typing is all about. Essentially, we take a sample of someone's blood, we split it up into three different components, a sample of blood here, a sample of blood here, and a sample of blood here. To those three different samples, we add anti-A antibody, anti-B antibody, and anti-RH antibody. What is shown here as anti-D, that's the same thing as anti-RH. So what we're going to do here is we are going to look for the telltale signs of hemagglutination. You can see hemagglutination with the A sample and the RH sample, but not the B sample. So if you take a sample of someone's blood and you mix it with a particular antibody and you see agglutination, that tells you that that antigen that is supposed to bind to that antibody must be present. So it tells you exactly what the person's blood type is on the basis of what you see when you type their blood with the hemagglutination. So essentially for this person that you see down here, we see hemagglutination with, with the anti-A and hemagglutination with the type RH. 
this person must be type A positive. They've got A antigen because we see agglutination there. They've got RH because we see hemagglutination there, but they do not have B antigens because we see no reaction there. So the person must be type A positive. So before we finish up here, what you're going to want to think about is what type of person is capable of donating blood to someone else? So again, what you're thinking about is you need to know the blood types of both individuals, the donor and the recipient. Again, we'll be doing a activity on this next week, but it's good to go ahead and start thinking about these things now. Again, you need to know the blood type of both the donor and the recipient. So keep in mind, the donor is not donating any of his or her antibodies. The blood plasma gets spun out so that we are only donating red blood cells. So you're only donating red blood cells. So all you have to consider is the antigen in the donor's blood and the antibodies in the recipient blood. So what you want to do for a good logical blood transfusion is you want to donate blood so that you do not get any hemagglutination in the recipient's body. So for example, this person here is type A positive. If they are the donor, they are donating A antigens and RH antigens. So really, the only person that can receive that is going to be someone that does not have anti-A antibodies or anti-RH antibodies. So basically someone who is also A positive. So we can talk more about blood typing dur during our Collaborate session, either this week or next week. Uh, you'll have an activity to do on it next week, so if you have trouble with that, we can definitely talk about that. But that pretty much does it for Chapter 18 for here. So I will go ahead and sign off as I always do. If you've got questions, be sure to let me know. And other than that, we should be done with Chapter 18, so next time we will start talking about the heart. So I will see you next time.